Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we uh, receive your invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good. We've tasted something today and we've seen it and we, uh, we know with you we are satisfied but we long for more when we taste and see. Um, and Lord, so we just invite you to help us in our hearts, in our defensiveness, our distraction, all, all the things that are going on that are very real, you know about. As we come to your word today, I pray that you'd help us receive it humbly, excitedly, in faith. And where there's wisdom, Lord, we pray that you would help and lead and guide us into fullness of life. That's why you came, to destroy the works of the devil and to lead us into fullness of life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm sure you know by now uh, that we are in the middle of a well-being series. Um, if you don't have a well-being book, there are some. So if you would like one and don't have one, do you want to pop your hand up and someone will give you one? Or you can get one. There's a couple here. So someone on the hospitality team could grab a few books, please. That would be super. Um, just at the front, please put your name in it. This has worked. We've got everyone to put their name in. There's been a few books um, left lying around. Actually, I stole someone else's book last week. Um, but their name was in it, so I was able to return it to them. Um, and so today we're looking at emotional well-being. Can you say emotion? Emotion. Um, so I just want you to pause for a moment and ask yourself, what am I feeling right now? Don't dig too deep, just be, so pop your hand up, the books are coming round. What are you feeling right now? Um, trying to discern what's going on. For some of us, it's a, we're good at taking time out and working out the inner life. For others of us, we're, it's just a bit of a strange concept, depending on our background. So, how is your emotion right now? What's, your, what's going on inside of you? Uh, we'll, we'll have a look at a bit about this, but um, I want to introduce you, first of all, to my dad. Here we go. Here's a picture of me and my dad. There you are. Um, as you can tell, it's a swimming pool and it's warm. I grew up in Zimbabwe. Um, and uh, I know what you're thinking. Most children start out cute <laughs> and then, you know, life takes its toll. For others of us, it doesn't start that way. And then, you know, it only gets better from there. The best wine is left for last. And the reason I'm telling you about my dad, if we can go to the next picture, that'd be great, is... Um, he is probably the toughest guy I've known. So that was the farm we lived on. My dad was one of these men who could almost do anything. So he managed the farm. It's like one of the largest cattle ranches in South Africa at one stage. Um, he could strip an engine and build it. He had fought in the war in Zimbabwe and done all sorts of things. And whilst an affectionate man and a wonderful father in many ways, sadly started drinking later in life and uh, is an alcoholic now in a, in a home, I only ever saw my dad cry once. I don't know if that's your experience maybe with your dad or something. He was affectionate, a good dad in many ways, but I only ever saw him cry once, and it was the most terrifying experience I ever had as a young man. My, we'd been giving him a hard time around the table. We were at boarding school. He was away a lot working, and they started to drink, and it all kind of exploded. And he went outside, and he sat on the step, and I'd never heard a man howl like that before. And it was the only time in his life that I remember him starting to express something of what was in him. He spoke about the war, some of the things he had seen, and some of the things he had done. And I remember that vividly from this time. It was the only time I got a glimpse into the real emotional life of my dad. And uh, I had to learn to cry. I know it sounds weird, not out of pain, of course he cried out of pain, I was not a hard man. But in terms of whilst our family was affectionate, learning to cry and express grief and allow yourself to do that, rather than just be tough and press on, which was a bit of an unsaid message in many ways. I've gone on a big journey when it comes to emotional well-being. My culture growing up in Zimbabwe, my school, boarding school, my family heritage is... Uh, there was lots of affection, but in terms of understanding and expressing some of the painful emotions um, and some of the joy, was actually a big, big journey for me. And then when I was on staff at a church down in Canterbury for many years, some of you would have heard of the name Pete Scazzera. 
who's written uh, a book called The Emotionally Healthy Church, Emotionally Healthy Leader. I really want to recommend it to you. As a leadership team, we realized we needed to really grow in understanding our emotions. Because the premise of this book is this. In church, you get a lot of people who are spiritually mature. The world tells us how to be physically healthy. And there's a lot of attention now on mental health to some degree. But sometimes in church, you can be very have people who are very spiritually mature, but emotionally not so mature. Um, and I think we identify that in ourselves. I think we, we speak about this a lot, but actually navigating how you handle the truth of God graciously and kindly because of who God is, not because of our heritage and our backgrounds or our frustrations. It has been quite a long journey for me. In, in one of those books, you can do, <laughs> do an assessment and at the end you get a rating whether you're an emotional adult, an emotional adolescent, an emotional child or an emotional infant. So I want to recommend that to you. But be kind to yourself, okay? Um, because it takes a bit of time to grow in these things. So I think for all of us, we can always grow better in our emotional well-being. Um, and we live in a bit of an emoji world, don't we? Uh, we live in a world which is like, just be, the true you and true freedom is expressing everything that's inside of you, almost regardless of the effect it has on other people. And actually your emotions are all valid, but you can control your behavior. So an example is a child is throwing a tantrum in the shop and the mother's overheard saying something about, don't behave like that. And then the child shouts back and says, you can't tell me what to feel. Have you ever heard that? Mother says, I'm not telling you how to feel, I'm telling you how to behave. Instinctively that feels good, but there are some emotions that are wrong. <laughs> there are some things that need to be trained, that need to be shaped. Sadness at the loss of someone is an appropriate emotion. Devastating sadness because you're envious of someone else having something you don't have is not a suitable emotion. It's real, but it's not suitable when we've got to train it. But we live in a world that says, you can't tell me what I feel is wrong. Yes, we can, because there is something that tells you what is true and what is real and what your anchor is. But it can be a very difficult world for us to go into this. God interested in and expects that we train our emotions so god commands obedience from the heart romans 6 17 the vessel that we often think is ungovernable he tells us what to fear and what not to fear what we must and must not delight in what we must abhor or that we must never be anxious that we how we can and cannot be angry the bible speaks to our emotions jesus was an emotional man some of you may have read the article the, or the book i think it's the article book the emotional life of our lord um, it's a really helpful part of it. So emotions are very real. They can feel very dominating. But when it comes to emotions, we're all like icebergs. Can you say iceberg? And that's not because it's cold today. But an iceberg, we often just see the surface. Apparently an iceberg can be 90% below the water, 10% above it. And its movement and its trajectory is more determined by the deeper currents than the wind and the waves and the sea. For many of us, we think these are the circumstances we're experiencing and we react and act and express certain emotions. But really, it's not because of the atmosphere around us. It's because of what are the deep currents of our emotions in our lives, just like an iceberg. Those things just reveal what's really deep, deep inside of us. And we've seen this with Elijah, haven't we? This major prophet who has this moment of victory and success and then this threat from this woman Jezebel, he seems to capitulate. And I know we're reading into it. We think, okay, there was something else going on in Elijah's life. So I'm sure you're familiar with this verse now. 1 Kings 19, verse 3 to 5. Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left the servant there. He isolated himself and he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down. And slept under the broom tree. There's some iceberg thing going on in his life. There's something lingering there that seems unresolved. And you and I are like these icebergs. Some of you are painfully aware of that. Okay, so maybe you grew up in an atmosphere where there was abuse or neglect or violence, but you're painfully aware that you're like an iceberg. And you think, okay, I know that some of the things I struggle with are because of these experiences in my life, especially family experiences or the significant others. Some of you are very painfully aware of that and you're working through it. For a lot of us, it's often very subtle. An anxious parent, a controlling parent, a driven parent. And we just don't understand or fully realize how 
whether it's a parent or those close to us, how that tends to shape and form us as we go on in life. And even if you have the perfect upbringing, which none of us have had, or the perfect environment atmosphere, ever since Adam and Eve shielded themselves, covered themselves, hid themselves from God, deflected responsibility, hiding away, there's something in us because of sin, that we're always deflecting, we're always trying to move away from something, we're always shielding and trying to cover shame with us. And then you throw in the dreaded COVID. Can you say COVID? <laughs> Our children have had two, however long it's been now, years of being conditioned to at best be cautious or at worst be anxious. Don't touch that. Don't go there. We're not going there because of that. You've got to calculate everything to make sure it's safe so that, I'm not saying any of that's bad, but for two and a half years, our children have been conditioned to be worried, or at least to think like that. Don't touch, don't go, don't, or, and to isolate themselves. <laughs> it's been inescapable. Not only our children, us as well, to some degree. And we think, oh, it's not really affecting us. Hey, it, it will have an effect, especially on the kids. Well, I think some years to come, God willing, we can redeem that and see it. And the church family has been an amazing aspect of grace for my family, especially just children seeing people going on in life, connecting with people. But we, when you throw COVID into the emotional icebergs that we are, and you throw in that COVID's made us echo chambers, you know, you know so we've, we've been alone, uh, often isolated a bit, and so our thoughts and our actions are more shaped by YouTube often, and by these virulent comments and the news and media, so we become these echo chambers, and we totally underestimate the sanctifying power of gathered community. So I met with a group of 20-odd leaders, uh, with a guy called Terry Virgo, pray for a few days, and we, and most of the comments came down to this: people seem to have changed dramatically by being isolated. Yeah. They are more vicious, more unkind, more critical. You think, why is that? It's because we've been in our own little world, and we haven't had the sanctifying power of realizing what I say affects you. On Zoom, you can hide the expression, can't you? But when we're around each other, sometimes we realize the hurt we cause. Someone says to us, hey, do you know that from those other minds? We miss that. So when you put all of this into a, the mystery of the emotional life, it's an important thing to look at. Would you agree? Emotions make wonderful servants, but terrible masters. So what is your emotional life like? Just have a quick thought. Are you green? Are things going brilliantly for you? Are you feeling on top of the world? You're understanding your emotions. You're feeling free. Are you a bit orange and amber? Things are just pressing your buttons a little bit more. There's more anxiety, more worry. You, you, you have to fight for joy. You have to fight for peace. You're not living in that place. And there'll be seasons of that for all of us. Or are you more on the red and you think, I realize I'm a mess. Most of my reactions are defensive. Most of my reactions are responsive to circumstances. Most of it is from a lack of security, identity, or self-worth. So just for a moment, think, am I in the red and the red or the green? or somewhere in the middle, on the amber. And wherever you are, I want you to know that there is hope. Can you say hope? Amen. Hope is a powerful thing. Our God is the God of hope. There is hope. Like Elijah, you went from despair and dejection and being distraught to being on mission for God and fruitful in his ministry. And going to be with Jesus in a chariot of fire, which is pretty, pretty cool. There is hope that we can recover. And there's hope, no matter how secure you think you are, that you can grow and be even more free and even more fruitful. God is in the business of breakthrough and well-being. Hallelujah. Yeah. That might be in moments of power. There was breakthrough power moments. Some of you have had that in this room. You just think, I met with Jesus and something changed radically in my life. Anyone got a testimony of something like that going on? Some of us have had that. You just... I got saved and I wasn't interested in that habit anymore. <laughs> just changed. My language changed like that. Some of us have had these moments in emotions where we think, I understand the Father's heart and it's freed me. For others of us, it's a journey. Yeah. Receiving the means of God's grace, His Word, His community, His Holy Spirit. But I want to look at three steps today. Three very simple steps. You're probably realizing this series is more about applying wisely good principles than anything new and revelatory. So the first one is to look in. Can you say, look in? Or to look back, or to get under the surface of your, of your life. Looking in, working out what's going on, 
It takes time. It takes slowing down. And it takes some habits and routines that will help you do that. Whether that's journaling, more time in prayer and reflection, sitting, talking with others. But there are two key questions when you want to look in your life as you start a journey to emotional well-being. Very simple. What and why? Okay, very, very simple questions. These, I think I can say to a huge degree, have changed my life. So I, I referred back to when I was on the Nelson team in Canterbury. We would have an hour-long breakfast every week. And one of us would be the focus. And we would uh, we were deliberately pursuing emotional awareness and well-being. And we would get, um, how would I, put it? I was going to say grilled, but that wouldn't reflect. That's a, that doesn't sound so positive. It was a really positive experience. But we'd ask someone, how are you doing? And we would share... And then there'll be lots of how questions, or what, what questions. What, what made you react like that? What were you feeling when that happened? What did you do after that? And then they'll ask this question, why? Why do you think? Because sometimes we just think, what were you feeling? I was feeling offended because that person didn't acknowledge me. We often leave it there, don't we? But then you follow up with a why. Why were you feeling offended? And that takes a bit of time to work out, doesn't it? Because we think, I'm offended because they ignored me, and we just move on. But if you start to ask yourself, why was I offended? You begin to realize that person has done absolutely nothing wrong. Sometimes, sometimes they have. And you think, I was a bit tired, and I served really hard, and I wanted to be praised. That's very different from, I was offended because they ignored me, and you move on. Because that way you're blaming someone else. You're not really understanding what's going on, do you think? Sometimes the answer is, I was offended because they were really rude. And that, that's okay, that can be an appropriate response. But sometimes like, I'm offended when you get people to ask you the why, because sometimes there's layers. <laughs> Are you sure? One question could go on for five minutes. Are you sure? You think, okay, I was offended because I was wanting praise. Actually, the approval of people means a heck of a lot to me. So asking these what and these why can Questions are really, really key. In this journey that I went on, still going on, four things clearly emerged, I think, for me. Number one, I, with my family, I put pressure on them to have deep conversations. <laughs> you know, so the dinner table, when you have a deep conversation, how was your day? Fine. No. <laughs> and I realized I was pressuring my family to have deep conversations. And after a long journey of working out why, it's because I never had them as a kid. And my family fell apart. And I'm like, what were my memories? So now I put pressure on my family out of a sense of frustration, out of a sense of loss, out of a, and the roots of that are way back in these emotions of loss and of disconnection that I have. Another one that came up is I really struggle to receive gifts. I don't anymore. Feel free to you know continue <laughs> sanctifying me. <laughs> um, but I, I, I used to really struggle receiving gifts, partly because of my upbringing. You earned everything that you had. People around you work hard just to live for another day. And I get given gifts. I, I, and I really struggle. Now, I'm getting better at simply saying, thank you, I appreciate that. No qualification. So you, you want to say, yeah, appreciate that. Oh, wow. Well, you know. And the other one would be accepting encouragement. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why, but I, I, I struggle to accept encouragement without disqualifying it. Thank you, but it wasn't me. Thank you, but I don't know, it's just, I felt uneasy, and I think because, well, there's lots of affection in our family, encouragement, you almost have to earn things, not in our family, but culture, you, you earn something. So now when someone sends a text to say, thank you, da-da, sometimes I'll respond say, yeah, thank you so much, da -da -da. but I often find something that's more, I just got to feel better, sometimes I just say, thank you, I appreciate that. How, how are you at handling encouragement mm -hmm. and receiving gifts? The other one was verbal expressions of love. Again, I realized family were getting frustrated. I was putting on them, getting angry when they didn't say, love you, dad, when you walk out the door. Or um, I've trained them well, they do now, but God's redeeming it. Um, but that's because I missed it as a child. And, I, I, and they brought up all these emotions in me. But I wouldn't have worked that out if there hadn't been a sustained period of asking what and why. What and why as we work these things out. This is not about shutting things down. As I said, Jesus was emotional. He wept. He got angry. He was filled with compassion. He felt intense pressure. This is about being free in our emotions to be authentic 
and then that have well-being. So as you ask these questions, why and what? So when you walk in the door after a long day of work and there's a mess everywhere and the kids are running everywhere and you, why am I the only one? You're just like, oh, I just, you don't know what, you're just angry. And then after about a little while of asking, instinctively you learn this question, what and why? It's because I just want peace. Because I deserve it and I've worked hard. Now, some of that, that, that's true. But asking what's going on, I'm angry, why? It's because, I, I don't know, maybe there's a sense of entitlement. Or maybe I think I work harder than everyone else here. And they, they should be ready for me at the end of the day. And, um, so just learning to ask that question really helps. And it's changed, I mean, most of the time, not always. Hopefully by the third step, what, why, oh, becomes a bit more automated. You know, maybe you're sitting in the lounge having a nice time, and there's kids running in and out of the garden. It's not always the kids' fault, by the way. I mean, all my examples are kids. Someone else is coming in and out of the garden, doing work. I've got a long way to go on this. Um, and you just suddenly freak out because the door's been open and it's cold. But you're not freaking out because it's cold, but you're worried about the financial heating bills, which is an authentic worry at the moment in some ways. But actually, there's something deeper than that. Maybe you grew up in this environment where every light had to be off and the heating had to be right down and you only turned it on in on December the 24th and off on January the 1st or something like that. Asking the what and the why question. So if you live with someone who's here, they've probably nudged you already or made a note thing. Yeah, I, I know that one. We can help each other grow in this and move on it simply by asking what and why. And just like sin, with sin there's usually a sin beneath the sin beneath the sin beneath the sin. You know that? You know, usually the root sin is we don't trust God. And it's manifested as something else, you know. So it is with emotions. There's emotion below the emotion below the emotion and you need to dig the root out. The Bible speaks a lot about the sense of looking back, looking in or looking back. And so it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 and 11, it says, now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. The Bible's full of looking at the saints of all, some amazing men and women, and the history of God's people and saying, learn from their mistakes. Yes, learn to emulate them, and learn to adopt some of their mannerisms and their faithfulness, but also learn from their mistakes. We need to do that in our own lives. Look at the Bible, with Jesus and his disciples, they had some amazing moments of power and following Jesus, but then they were fighting over who was the greatest. Do you think something's unresolved going on there? You've been with Jesus quite a few years now, but there's still some stuff going on there. David, he was a worshipper and an adulterer and a murderer. When you look at his family, there was sexual sin back there. And maybe there's a way of thinking and feeling, because they're all connected on day, our minds, our hearts, emotions, physical well-being. Look at Elijah, we just saw that example. Abraham, there's a pattern in his family of the favoured child. <laughs> you can start to see how things get rooted in us. All of these questions, what a while to wrestle with, looking in and trying to understand what's going on. But then as part of the solution, not just left to ourselves, and I hinted that, there's number two, is to look out. Can you say look out? Yeah. Or around you, okay? So if you think about your family history, the church becomes where you are reparented. The church becomes your first family. Scripture is quite clear that you're now part of a blood bought family. And actually the DNA within fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is one that will last into eternity. And is the primary shaping of us in Christ than any biological shaping we've ever had. Amen. We're grateful for that. And for some of it, we're not so grateful for. But we're part of this new family. Get help. Of course, get professional help. Some of us need that just to work out how we can even enter this world. I think that was it with my dad. How do I enter this world of brokenness? The thing I've done and seen without totally crumbling. And I wonder if that's what started to trigger off some of the, some of the drinking. But if you want to get help from others, you need to invite people and invest in those relationships. You need to give people permission and you need to give people time to speak into your life. You know the scripture, consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Consideration takes a bit of knowing the person and working out what's the best way to help this person. How can I best win their hearts to help them? So you need permission and time. When was the last time with a fellow brother or sister in Christ, you had one of those really healthy but uncomfortable conversations? You know those ones. You have a nice conversation and then they say something to you. That's a bit of a challenge. 
shines a bit of light, or you just make a comment about a colleague at work, really critical or gossipy, and they say, hey, why have we moved into gossip? When was the last time we had one of those conversations? Or a fellow brother or Christ, sister in Christ just shot a bit of light and I was getting uncomfortable. But it was really freeing. Some while back, I was chatting to someone in the church and I was asking some of these questions. Questions they took for granted were no go areas. This is years ago. And I said, No one's ever asked me these questions. Some of us have never been asked those questions, have, have we? They can go as detailed as, hey, how's your budget? Have you put God first with your money? They've asked anyone that question? Then they can then be, okay, so you TV, what are you watching? Just in friendship, good, good friendship, but they have permission to ask you these questions. What are you watching? Your time, how are you prioritizing it? Are you resting yourself so you give your best to your workplace or to God? Or you burn the candle at both ends? So, you know, the answer is not always simple. Mm. But you need to be asked those questions, mm. and we need to ask them. Otherwise, we just go through life and think we're doing okay. We have our blind spots. Some people speak to me, and I, sometimes I, um, one of the challenges is how harshly I can speak to my kids. But I hate it. But sometimes some friends say, yeah, you being harsh with your kids, but it's painful. But it's so helpful. Because I just get in the mode of that's what I do. In the moment, and you move on. But then it repeats again and until someone says, how's it been for a few? So when was the last time you had these uncomfortable, good conversations? If you want to grow, you need to invest in relationships and give people permission. So we talk about a culture of discipleship, here at Redeemer. What we mean by that is that we're in each other's lives, discipling each other. Very deliberately, but very normally. <laughs> it's the life of a Christian. We make it all about Jesus. How's your attitude to work? How's your attitude to money? How's your attitude to your body? How's your attitude to these things? Now, that takes time because you don't always just have those conversations. <laughs> I'm not saying every time you meet up with someone, oh, how are you doing? You know, that, that's not the point of it. So how can we glorify Jesus together? Hey, there's this area I think you can walk into freedom a little bit, little bit more. That's what we mean when we talk about discipleship culture. And these things are hard. It's a bit like a splinter. Anyone got a splinter at the moment? No? Yeah? Oh, sorry, Sarah. Okay, yeah. So you know splinters, you know that the best thing is to get it out. Yeah? Everyone agree? Yeah. But you don't want to go there, do you? Because <laughs> it's like, but if you leave it, it's going to get septic and yeah. grow over. It might get embedded in your skin, and then years later it pops out. You know, it's, it's amazing how your body does that. But it'll still be painful. It's like my daughter gets splinters. It's the most dramatic thing we ever do. <laughs> but she has learned it's the best thing. To just get it out. Because we want to draw back, don't we? It's so sensitive, we want to draw back. And that's what we get when we start talking about these emotions. How do you do? Why? why? Oh, no, draw back. No, no, no. Stay the course, brothers and sisters, with each other. With people you love and trust, which is why it takes time. Yeah. So you know that their heart for you is good. Yeah. And invite those people into your lives. As a brief point. So look in, look around, get help from each other. And then thirdly, and most importantly, look up. Can you say, look up? Hallelujah. Ultimately, all the looking in and back, the looking to others around us is done in faith and expectation of God's help. When you go to the doctor, you can do that in faith. Do you realize that? I'm in faith that God's going to use this person to bring something into me. That's why we pray. Give them wisdom. Lord, help them. So that we don't pray for healing in other ways. But everything can be done in faith and expectation of God's help. Any pursuit of freedom and fullness is based on what Christ has done for us in the confidence of our new creation status and the help of the Holy Spirit. He has given us each other. He gives us the security and the stability to go to those places in our lives of hurt, of pain and regret. Because why would you go there if you don't have Jesus as your bedrock? It's just going to open up this... that You don't have anyone to take it to. You don't have anyone to hold you stability as you work through it. Our security in Him means we can look at the worst bits of ourselves yeah. and know He's absolutely flawed but deeply, deeply loved yeah. and accepted. I say to my kids every night, I love you when you're good, I love you when you're bad, I love you all the time because I'm your dad. Because I want to know, I want them to know when they crash the car when they're 16. <laughs> it doesn't change that I love them. <laughs> Is that me, guys? I grew up in Zimbabwe, anything goes. Anyway, I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. Uh, where, where was I? Um, so these are not just good practices. These are faith habits 
done with the expectation that God will work. We look up in hope. Yeah. Christian hope in God for all things, ultimate hope, but hope for his help here now, is active. Hope is not, I hope, therefore I'll wait and see. Christian hope acts. I hope, therefore I'll act in anticipation that God will do it. That's how faith works. Faith doesn't stand still. I trust God will do it. Faith says, I trust God will do it. I'm going to step into the sea. And it parts. And it parts. That's how faith works. That's how hope in Christ works. God, I, I'm, I'm hoping in you for freedom from these emotions. You step into being vulnerable. It's terrifying. You go again. And you go again. And you go again. We look up to the one who says that we are new creations. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a... The old has... It's not hiding behind the door. It's not just that dead. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Are you in Christ? You can feel like the old man's still there, can't it? But he ain't. He's dead. Just like Pharaoh and his army drowned in the sea. God's people in, in the desert wondering. They still acted as if they were slaves. They still had slave mentality. They wanted to go back and eat stew because it was easy life. But their slave master was dead. Gone. Vanquished. Sometimes we live like that, as if we still have the slave master, because it feels like, we're not denying that there's a wrestle, but your identity, your standing for Christ, is that the old is gone and the new has come. So my heritage in Christ is not, my, my biological heritage is not who the true I, true I am is. Does that make sense? That's not who I am anymore. I'm in Christ. I have a new family. I have a new heritage. I don't deny the effects of it, but it's not fundamentally my identity. We look up to the one who says that you and I can reign in life. Love that phrase. Yeah. Reign in life. Can you say reign in life? Yeah. Romans 5 said, If by one man's trespass, death reigns through that one man, Adam, infected everyone with sin, Adam and Eve, how much more, the Bible uses the argument of lesser to greater often, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness yeah. reign in life? One man wrecked creation with his sin. Terribly. How much more those who are in Christ will reign in life. Brothers and sisters, there is freedom. There is hope for you to reign in life over your emotions, over your background, over your history. That you think, I just got to live with this. It might be a long journey, but receive overflowing grace today. We look up to the one who says that we may walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. Therefore we were buried with him in baptism into death in the water down dead in all of that just as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father so too you and i can walk in newness of life if you don't remember if you haven't memorized these verses and you struggle at any time with feeling like the old person you're missing out on overflowing means of grace take hold of the truth of the word of god and when the enemy accuses you you say no 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 i'm a new creation no, 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 I'm not a slave, I will reign in life by the grace of God. No, 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 I'm going to walk in newness of life. Again, and again, and again, and again. We look up with hope to the God of hope. I mentioned this verse at the beginning, and we come to an end with this. Now may the God of hope fill you, listen to the emotions here, with all joy. So this is where with preaching, it can be really fruitful. I'm just reading scripture here. But you can say in your heart with faith, I'm taking hold of this one. That's how I take hold of it. So it's not unprofitable for you. It doesn't just fall on ears. Say, God, fill me. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy. Who wants them joy? And peace. Shalom. As you believe. So that you can get by and have a peaceful day. No, no, no. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So that you may overflow with hope mm -hmm. by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Lord, restore hope in your hearts this morning. Mm -hmm. Hope to break free from the sin that seems to so easily attack. <coughs> hope to know joy and peace as a tangible reality as if walking with Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit ask him 
your own thing right now in this moment. Hope for your marriage. Hope for that relationship. Hope to be fully healed from any sickness, from all sadness, so that you may overflow. And we look up, lastly, to the Father to have our hearts guarded. He wants their heart guarded. Proverbs says, desire fulfilled a tree of life. High hope deferred makes the heart sick and low. You don't want to be living like this. In the middle, above all else, guard your heart for us the wellspring of life. So that when you hit a low, hope is deferred, or when you have desire fulfilled, your heart's guarded in Christ Jesus. You enjoy the highs, you're sad about the lows, but you're not, you're not living like this. Amazing verse, Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. You know it well, don't you? Do not be anxious about anything. Do not, don't don't, don't go on too quickly. Do not. Think about how you read that. This is a father who's given you everything you need for life and godliness, who promises by the power of the Holy Spirit, says do not. Not do not. Do not. Do not. Do not be anxious about the big stuff. About anything. You're more precious than a lily and a sparrow. And God's aware of it. He captures every tear in a jar. Do not be anxious about anything. But in contrast, so when that happens, but in everything, by prayer, talking to your most beloved one, by prayer and supplication, asking him for help and freedom and grace. With, that's it, isn't it? Everyone who talks about emotional health, psychologists, they'll tell you gratitude is a great discipline to have. We've been reading it for a long time. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. God, I'm facing this. I'm not going to give into anxiety, but rather... And come to you with prayer and supplication. I'm going to give thanks that you've promised I'm a new creation, that I'll walk in newness of life, that I'm not a slave to sin, that you've provided and cared for me before. Because if you're going through this now, God's got you through a lot of other things to get to this point. And here's the promise the peace of God, the shalom and flourishing, just the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. So it's supernatural, it doesn't make sense sometimes. Will God your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you want to summarize this voice, this verse, thanksgiving to God in Christ Jesus. It's a powerful weapon. I felt that this morning, so I've got a lingering exercise migraine. I get them when I play hockey on Saturdays, but sometimes they linger. Just being in God's presence. There's just some healing and rest. And it's still lingering, but there's just something restful. There's a piece of God doing something. God's presence. It's not exactly this verse, but there's something this morning. Tasted, seen that the Lord is good. So just as we come to an end, I don't know if the worship team will come up, but I just want you to be still as they do that. When you close your eyes, the Lord has joy and peace for you. Come, Holy Spirit. If nothing else, just take two minutes to rest right now. You can ignore me, switch off, take a deep breath, drop your shoulders. Just be still. Think through some of the verses. You think, I want that, Lord. I need that, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit.
have to feel anything or do anything, just be. Now the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I don't know your, don't know your name. I, ju I just felt the Lord would say, He delights to shield you. Like a mother hen, He delights to bring you peace, to bring you comfort. And you've known that. The Lord wants to give you a sweeter experience, of, not an awareness, an experience of that in greater measure. Bless her. his disciples to stay awake and pray and he came back and they were asleep <laughs> and he went off in his most anxious moment he came back they were asleep and yeah he didn't get fed up with it he went to the cross and embraced them for them it's that same grace that we receive today for us it's also the grace that you can have for everyone around you how much the marriage Jesus we remember your body broken while those who denied you were standing there you looked with mercy you were spat upon and mocked and you said Father forgive them some of you today you need to forgive there's unforgiveness you have been harboring and you need to for your freedom, for the honor of Jesus, you need to forgive. So before you eat the wafer this morning, forgive that person in Christ. Hand them over to the Lord Jesus. You no longer take responsibility for the pain and justice. Justice is in God's hand when you forgive. And he's a perfect judge. Lord, we remember you. Thank you. drink the wine, others need to receive forgiveness. Yeah, you did treat her badly. Yes, you did betray him. Yes, you did. You did. You did. But the blood of Christ speaks a better word, brother and sister. It says, mine, cleansed and free. So whatever it is you've done or thought or said, you are free in Jesus if you would even now to say I'm sorry Lord thank you Jesus for the better word the cleansing by the blood of the Lamb 
The sea.